So in vibratory lift part one, we talked about a type of vibratory push in the vertical direction is a possible technique to propel masses against gravity. To aid in the lifting of said masses with sound in conjunction with simple or compound machines, such as the lever, the crane, or even by hand. Stay tuned to this video as I attempt to explain a more developed version of vibratory lift. I will also highlight some interesting apparent similarities between the gravitation ideas of John Keeley, Edward Lee Scounin, and Nikolai Kozarev, and how they relate to a potential technique for full gravity control and levitation. John Worrell Keeley defined vibratory lift simply as levitation caused by vibration. It was conceived to be the principal part of his aerial suspension and navigation system. In Keeley's own words, gravity is nothing more than a concordant, attractive, sympathetic stream flowing towards the neutral center of the earth, and that by exciting the metallic mass composing a navigator of any given weight, it may be suspended and propelled. The vibratory neutral negative attraction evolved will bring it into perfect commercial control by keeping it in sympathy with the Earth's polar stream. The document goes on to explain that this was why Achilles sought to find the sympathetic connection between luminous ether or the inflowing celestial streams and the radiating, radiating or terrestrial streams, which by their interaction solar tensions against terrestrial condensations cause the polar current and its kindred phenomena. While he used sympathetic negative attraction for running machinery, he sought to use for aerial navigation another force, a negation of sympathetic neg negative attraction, or the same force that regulates the recession of the planets from each other. The power of the terrestrial propulsive and celestial attractive is to lift, and of the celestial propulsive and to terrestrial attractive is to descend. Certain polar or antipolar vibrations can intensify either of these qualities so as to cause either of them to predominate. Intensifying the celestial will cause the metallic mass to rise. Keeley goes on to say, an airship of any number of tons of weight can, when my system is completed, float off into space with a motion as light as thistledown or with a velocity outrivaling that of a cyclone. With a force of corpuscular bombardment, its movements can be as varied as is necessary for commercial use at any desired elevation and at any desired speed. These quotes are from the Snell Manuscript, which is said to contain the most comprehensive material from Keeley found so far. So Keeley seems to be saying that the mechanical sound vibrations from man-made musical instruments can be used to create a sympathetic connection between those vibrations and what he terms the polar streams of force. He says that both polar and antipolar vibrations can be used. According to Keeley, the polar forces include electricity, magnetism, and gravity. In other words, electromagnetism, which includes light and gravity. The definition of polar, of course, is having equal opposites. And antipolar means having no polarity and is apparently synonymous with the term depolar. Modern science says that polarization is a property applying to transverse waves that spe specifies the geometrical orientation of the oscillations. In a transverse wave, the direction of oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the wave. A simple example of a polarized transverse wave is vibrations traveling along a taut string, like a guitar string. Depending on how the string is plucked, 
The vibrations can be in the vertical direction, the horizontal direction, or any angle perpendicular to the spring, the stream. In contrast, in longitudinal waves, such as sound waves in a liquid or gas, the displacement of the particles in the oscillation is always in the direction of propagation. So these waves do not exhibit polarization. Transverse waves that exhibit polarization include electromagnetic waves, such as light and radio waves. It includes gravitational waves, as well as transverse sound waves which would be shear waves in solids. But are there any commonalities or agreement between the modern science, science's definition of polarization and Keeley's? Either way, it appears that there can be a coupling or sympathy between these polar and antipolar vibrations. Keeley clarifies even further by professing that certain notes, namely B flat, D natural, and F, correspond to the polar forces, while the notes D, F sharp, and A correspond to the dipolar forces. This strongly suggests that specific frequencies are required in order to be in sympathy with the Earth's polar streams. In the following article, a professor John Holland says that sound waves made up of typically neutral particles can interact with light waves in the atmosphere. To re-clarify, some sound waves can also be transverse, but typically they are longitudinal and thus neutral or antipolar. Light waves, on the other hand, can be polarized. It goes on to say that because the photons of light travel so much faster than the phonons of sound waves, that there is actually a flow of energy from the light waves to the sound waves causing the polarization or the energizing of the latter. Keeley, like modern science, recognizes the polar forces to include gravity and electromagnetism. This is even more interesting in light that Keeley was once said to have made the needle of a compass to move with only sound vibrations without the introduction of a magnet into the experiment. Was he able to use sound to couple to ambient or background electromagnetism? He further says here that the proper vibrations can intensify or accelerate magnetism or gravitation. On the gravity side, we now know that gravity waves do exist. They have been predicted for quite some time and were finally detected in 2015. Gravity, wa gravity waves also travel at the speed of light, and so it is logical to assume that, like light, they can also be coupled to sound. Is this what Keeley meant when he claimed that exciting the molecular mass could bring it into sympathy with the Earth's polar streams? And does in sympathy mean being in phase and in a harmonic relationship to the frequencies of those streams? Another interesting and previously mentioned aspect of sound is that phonons, the quantum quasi-particle representation of sound, possess certain properties of their own, such as carrying negative gravitational mass, having a type of buoyancy in the Earth's gravitational field. Additionally, there is also an in interesting figure in the book Antigravity and the World Grid by David Hatcher Childress which actually gives a frequency of 10 to the 12th hertz or one terahertz for radiated gravity. What is the origin of this very specific figure and how is it derived? I haven't been able to find this figure mentioned in any other liter literature. Modern mainstream science states that gravitational waves are expected to have frequencies between 10 to the negative 16th to 10 to the 4th hertz but acknowledges that they could exist at any frequency, though there is currently uh, no credible source for detectable gravitational waves of very high frequencies anywhere near one terahertz. My guess would be, would be that, that the figure emerged from scientific work that was carried out decades ago 
in the field of alternative propulsion systems. So this all seems to be saying that you have both pushing and pulling, or perhaps opposing pushing streams of force originating from the earth as well as every celestial body, manifesting as modulated currents of energy, and that by vibrating a mass, we could establish a sympathetic connection between that mass and specific streams, allowing those selected streams to predominate. As Keeley says in his typically unique way, intens intensifying the celestial will cause a metallic mass to rise, thereby inducing high neutral radiation together with celestial attraction. The concept of earthly events as being affected by the energy and forces of the cosmos is indeed an old one, manifesting in the philosophy of astrology to associations of aberrant behavior with the full moon, and even the same as above, so below. Ideas of terrestrial energies as having their own effects can be seen in the ideas of ley lines, or the more scientifically accepted term, tell your currents as well as the ancient stories, such as the myth of Antaeus, who derived his vast superhuman strength from his mother, the Earth. The resultant effects on any system, then, would be the net effects of all incoming energies and also dependent on which type of energy is more dominant at any given time. The idea of radiating and inflowing streams of energy also seems to extend to the ideas of Edward Lee Scounin, the builder of modern-day megalith Coral Castle, who contended that streams composed of micromagnets originating from within the Earth caused gravitation by attracting the micromagnets, which he believed composed all of matter. In 2002, on a show called Encounters with the Unexplained, hosted by late actor Jerry Orbach, author and engineer Christopher Dunn who is familiar with Lee Scounin's theories, presented the idea that Lee Scounin might have created an anti-gravitational effect by reversing the polarity of the magnets within the mass to be moved, such that those magnets collectively would repel the incoming magnets from the Earth as opposed to the usual attraction. This would function to either levitate or reduce the weight of the coral stones. Dunn believes that this may have been achieved with a modulated electromagnetic signal. Lee Scalin's theories still classify gravity as mostly a pulling force rather than a pushing or a resultant force. It may be strange to envision gravity as a pushing force or effect, but let's glance back at Einstein's equivalence principle for a moment. It states that being on a rocket in deep space that is accelerating at 32 feet per second squared will be indistinguishable from being subjected to Earth's gravity. But Earth's gravity is typically classified as a pulling force or effect, while the accelerating rocket would manifest its gravity as a pushing force, pushing into us and any objects within that rocket. Lee Scounin's theories, which are explained in his book, Magnetic Current, are very interesting indeed, as he had a very detailed understanding of magnetism and envisioned it as not a static force, but rather a very dynamic one, strikingly similar to Keeley's energetic streams. Keeley's theories also include magnetic streams of force, in addition to gravitational and electrical streams. These forces could be harnessed for levitation and propulsion, either individually or collectively. This will follow as there are several different ways to levitate a mass. Electrostatics or magnetism could be used, and certainly electromagnetism as envisioned by Nikola Tesla and Eric Lathwaite. And according to the claims of Otis T. Carr, John Searle, and others, a rotational inertial system can be used as well. And Victor Schauber's propulsion concept of the repulsing employ all of these aspects. Another intriguing manifestation of Keeley's vibratory lift ideas is as follows. A small instrument having three gyroscopes as a principal part of its construction 
is used to demonstrate the facts of aerial navigation. These gyroscopes are attached to a heavy inert mass of metal weighing about one ton. The other end of the apparatus consists of tubes enclosed in as small a space as possible being clustered in a circle. These tubes represent certain cores which are coincident to the streams of force acting upon the planet, focalizing and defocalizing upon its neutral center. The action upon the molecular structure of the mass lifted was based upon the fact that each molecule in the mass possessed a north and a south pole, or more strictly speaking, a positive and negative pole, situated through the center formed by the three atoms which compose it. No matter which way the mass of metal is turned, the poles of the molecule point undeviatingly towards the polar center of the Earth, acting almost exactly as the dip needle when uninfluenced by extraneous conditions, electrical or otherwise. The rotation of the disks of the gyroscopes produce an action upon the molecules of the mass to be lifted, reversing their poles, causing repulsion from the Earth in the same way as light poles of a magnet repel each other. This repulsion can be diminished and increased according to the mechanical conditions that are operated. By operating the th three discs, starting them at full speed, then touching two of them so as to bring them according to the tone that they represent by their rotation to a certain vibratory ratio, the weight then slowly sways from side to side leaving the floor and rising several feet in the air, remaining in that position, and as the discs gradually decrease their speed of rotation, the weight sinks slowly back down to the floor, settling down as lightly as thistle down. Whereas one molecule can be lifted, there need be no limit as to the number in a structure that may be operated as easily as, easily as one. The craft will be capable of being driven under the power of depolar repulsion at a rate of 300 miles an hour. The size of the structure is unimportant. The heaviest can be as easily controlled as the lightest. This is fascinating indeed. The model described uses three gyroscopes, but not in the way that we typically think when discussing gyroscopes and gravity. Instead, each of the three discs were used solely to generate vibratory notes as any rate of rotation can be associated with an accompanying vibratory rate. We know from previous discussions that Keeley used what he called the mass chord to vibrate an object rather than one singular frequency. And a chord is a fundamental note as well as two or three of its harmonics sounded simultaneously. Keely claimed that all objects have a mass chord. In the description of the contraption, he mentions starting the disc of the gyroscopes at full speed and then slowing two of them, the first one running at full speed, the second one at a slower speed, and the third disc running at an even slower speed, all in harmonic or whole number ratios in relation to each other. Most writings on sonic levitation mentioned that the sounds used to levitate a mass must be tuned to that mass, whether it be a singular tone or if it's Keeley's three-note mass chord. It doesn't say whether or not the gyroscope's rotational rates were actually tuned to the mass of metal. And it seems that using gyroscopes or flywheels for this purpose, while ingenious, might be more difficult to tune than an actual musical instrument. The weight is also said to have swayed from side to side as if it were caught up in a vortex, just as discussed in the video, the Tibetan levitation technique. This is interesting as it is said that these energies flow in vortexual patterns. Another thing which can be deduced from the description is that the levitated mass's height seemed to be dependent on the rotational speeds of the disks, losing height as the disk slowed down. All, all the while remaining in harmonic relation to each other. 
This seems to suggest that the higher the vibratory frequencies, the higher the weight rises. The other part of the apparatus is less clear. The tubes cluster in a circle. It's said that these tubes represent certain chords coincident to the streams of force acting upon the planet, focalizing and defocalizing upon its neutral center. In other words, the previously mentioned polar streams, which radiating from the Earth and influence celestial streams. Coincident means to be in harmony with. So these chords are in tune with the vibratory rates of these streams of force that are acting upon the Earth. Hence, the tubes themselves function as resonators, whose frequencies are dependent on their physical dimensions. It is not said how many tubes there were clustered in the circle, but if there are three notes per stream, then this might bring the number of tubes to nine. But it is unclear as to how this part of the apparatus was connected to or attached to the rest of the system. There is some additional theoretical information in the passage which points to the molecules of the mass itself each having their own north and south poles. These poles pointing to the exact center of the earth. If the mass is turned, then the poles will move in light turn so as to remain in the position to point to the center just like the compass or dip needle aligns itself to the earth's magnetic field. In this resting position, the pole's alignment result in gravitation, but the vibratory actions of the disks can disrupt this resting condition by reversing the alignment of the poles such that there is a repulsion resulting in levitation. But why would vibration result in this action? Are the molecular poles disrupted by the vibratory rates being rendered unable to realign themselves quickly enough due to the speed of those vibrations? Is this the reason that the mass loses levitation height as the vibratory rates slow? And if so, can extremely fast rotation of a mass also overwhelm the ability of these molecule or molecular poles to realign? Does this have any connection to Otis Carr's proposed levitation system, which relies on rotation? Another thing which is interesting is how similar the description of these molecular poles is to Leet Skowlin's micromagnet theory mentioned earlier. As we recall, according to Leet Skowlin, the poles of these micromagnets streaming from the Earth attract the opposite poles of the micro micromagnets within all matter, thus resulting in attraction or gravitation as proposed. And as Chris Dunn theorized, Leet Skowlin may have produced levitation or weight reduction by reversing these poles seemingly in a manner not too dissimilar to that which was proposed in Keeley's gyroscopic contraption. Do the similarities of these different theories point to basic underlying principles? How do these ideas fit in with the gravity as push or resultant force concepts that were mentioned in the video vibratory push process? If gravity is the result of an etheric wind or stream of force pushing us onto the planet from above, then does vibration or rotation function to divert or cast off some of this flow, resulting in mitigated gravity? That would certainly cause weight reduction, but what about levitation? Is it a pull, a push, or a resultant? On his site, The Divine Cosmos, Alternative theorist David Wilcox writes, Here, it is very important for us to remember that there are actually two different forces working together in the Earth to create what we measure as gravity. In bluntly simple terms, gravity is not just down. It is the natural balance between the forces of down and up. So using Keeley's terminology, there is the tractor force that moves towards the core, and there is a pressure force that moves away from the core. Therefore, what we interpret as gravity is the leftover force once the up and down energy movements have canceled each other out. Keeley calls this point of balance the dominant. If we, if we look at the battle between gravity and levity as a type of push of war rather than the familiar tug of war game, 
where the two teams are pushing towards each, each other instead of pulling away from each other, then gravity, the force that presses down, is always winning over levity by a set balanced amount, which we now know as the gravity constant. Keeley once said that gravity is nothing more than a concordant, attractive, sympathetic stream flowing towards the neutral center of the Earth. But as just mentioned, this sympathetic stream is somewhat counterbalanced by the opposing force, which today we might call anti-gravity. This is also called a pressure force, which radiates away from the core and is Keeley's terrestrial propulsive and celestial attractive force. The attractive force, on the other hand, moves towards the core and is synonymous with Keeley's celestial propulsive and terrestrial attractive. Both oppressive force and attractive force working together to, to create what we call gravity would then follow as Keeley is claimed to have not only been able to change the relationship of these forces to each other in order to reduce weight or levitate a mass, but also to make that same mass much heavier via supergravitation. Another way to understand this is with a balance between gravity and the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation, which is at a maximum at the Earth's equator, where the ground speed is about 1,000 miles per hour. The centrifugal force at the Earth slightly counteracts gravity and functions as a type of levity. Hence, a mass would weigh 0.4% less at the equator as opposed to the Earth's poles. An object that weighs 1 million pounds at the poles would weigh 4,000 pounds less at the equator. If the, Earth's speed, if the speed of the Earth's rotation were to increase by 16 to 17 times to about 17,000 miles per hour at the equator, then this percentage weight loss would increase to about 100%, as the centrifugal levity would then be strong enough to levitate us just above the Earth in what would essentially be low Earth orbit. We know empirically that the space station must maintain a speed of about 17,130 miles per hour in order to remain in geostationary orbit. This concept of resultant inertial forces as, relate to, as relates to modern orbital science might help us to better understand Keeley's concept of the dominant as the net force between pressure and tractor flows. So is matter a collection of energy sinks for these energetic flows are Keeley's polarized molecules, as described in the Trinuan gyroscopic experiment, simply directionalized sinks that make up the whole, being conduits for a greater amount of the celestial propulsive energy to flow in towards the Earth while in the resting state? And are vibrations able to disrupt this resting state and completely reverse the polarity of these sinks such that the terrestrial propulsive and celestial attractive streams can flow to a stronger degree? while the celestial propulsive and terrestrial attractive uh, energies are temporarily mitigated. Overall, it seems uncertain as to if Keeley's gyroscopic contraption was something that he actually built and tested, or if it was only a conceptual model which sought to visualize his theories, as I haven't yet found any additional mention of this particular device. Also, it seems unclear as to how one would accurately tune the notes of the rotating disc to the mass itself. According to accounts, later experiments use actual musical instruments, as well as Keeley's famous gold, silver, and platinum wire instead of gyroscopes. A number of other sonic levitation experiments are ascribed to Keeley. Probably the most popular and most publicized being what is known as the weights and jars experiments. Keeley apparently developed and perfected this demonstration over some time as there are several iterations of it. The basic setup included one to several metallic masses weighing several ounces which were placed at the bottom of a water-filled jar. At the top of the jar is a cap to which a wire was fastened. The wire in question was most likely the trinuan gold, silver, and platinum wire that was utilized in other experiments. The other end of this wire was attached to what is called the liberator or transmitter, 
which in turn was in direct contact with a musical instrument as a source of the acoustic vibrations. Variations of this experiment include differences in the layout and instrumentation. With this setup in mind, one such variation is as follows. Keeley took a bit of string out of his pocket and wound it around a little brass spindle in front of the cylinder on top of his transmitter, then jerked the loose end and set the spindle whirling. Then he sat down by the transmitter and began striking the strings of what looked like a harp in the cupboard like base of the transmitter. While one hand was playing on the strings of this harp, the other was moving tentatively about on the resonant rods on top of the base of this transmitter. Keeley claimed that when the same note on both the rods and the harp strings was struck, the force was at that instant generated. All depended on the exact note. The mass of weights at the bottom of the jar of water only quivered, then all remained motionless. He once again sounded the harp in the cupboard and the resonant bars on top of it, explaining to his guests that he was trying to get the mass chord of those weights. He explained that every aggregation of molecules or of matter has a sympathetic chord through which it was a medium that he could operate his vibratory force. The cord was not found for some minutes. Again, the spindle was spun by the help of the twine and its whiz was distinct in the silence of the room. The search for the mass cord continued on the harp and the resonant rods. A deep, clear note resounded from both at the same time, and at the instant that it broke on the ear, the weight that lay on the bottom of the jar by itself quivered, and then slowly but steadily moved up through the water, as if impelled by some irresistible force, until it pinched on the top of the jar. In another iteration of this experiment, Keeley developed special discs which were placed on top of the jar and which were sensitive to the energy from space. He classified these discs according to the attractive or repulsive forces which they generated, using the terms polar and depolar, with the attractive disc being polar and the repulsive ones being depolar. The gold, silver, and platinum wire was connected between these discs and a musical instrument. The levitation was carried out as usual, with, but with the exception that the weights that were suspended would remain suspended even after the original sound had been discontinued. He claimed that on two occasions, when an observer removed the disc from the top of the jar, the suspended weights instantly fell, crashing through the bottom of the glass jar. Russian astrophysicist Nikolai A. Kozirov is another person who delved into these forces, which he named torsion waves or time flow energy. Kozirov considered that all life forms might be drawing off of an unseen spiraling source of energy, in addition to their normal properties of gaining energy through eating, drinking, breathing, and photosynthesis. He envisioned this spiraling energy that was in fact the true nature and manifestation of time. And he felt that time as we know it, it was much, much more than just a simple function for counting duration. He strove to think of a cause for time, something that was tangible and identifiable in the universe that we can associate. The terms torsion fields and or torsion waves were used to describe the spiraling flow of time energy that Kozirov discovered. In his vernacular, gravity was actually a spiraling flow of time energy that was constantly flowing into an object. 
The same energy that was creating the earth was also creating and flowing into us. We are then caught up in the gigantic current of the river of energy that streams into the earth, much as mosquitoes get stuck to a screen while the air is blowing right through the screen. Our bodies cannot travel through solid matter, but the current of time flow energy certainly can. And this was one of the many things that Keeley, Tesla, and Kozirov and others demonstrated. A star or planet must continuously draw energy from its environment in order to stay alive. The article goes on to say that almost all Western scientists believe that Einstein's general and special relativity theories eliminate the need for an ether. And indeed, Einstein did advocate for the rejection of the ether in 1910, which is where mainstream science still believes his thoughts ended on the issue. However, in 1920, Einstein actually stated that the hypothesis of the ether does not contradict the special theory of relativity. And in 1924, he wrote, in theoretical physics, we cannot get along without the ether, i.e. a continuum assigned physical properties because the general theory of relativity excludes direct long range action. In each theory of short range action assumes the presence of continuous fields and consequently the existence of the ether. So it appears that Einstein may not have totally dispensed with the idea of the ether as is often insisted by modern mainstream scientists. Continuing on in the article, in 1913, Dr. Eli Carton was the first to clearly demonstrate that the fabric or flow of space and time in Einstein's general theory of relativity is not only curved, but is also possessed of spinning or spiraling movement within itself, known as torsion. This area of physics is typically referred to as the Einstein-Cartan theory, or ECT. Cartan's theory wasn't taken too seriously at the time, as it came out before the days of quantum physics, when elementary particles such as electrons were believed to rotate or spin as they orbited the nucleus. In order to get a grasp on Kozira's work and related findings, certain new analogies for physical matter are required. Kozira's work forces us to visualize all physical objects of matter in the universe as if they were sponges that were submerged in water. In all of these analogies, we should consider the sponges as having remained in water for a long enough period of time that they are completely saturated. Bearing this in mind, there are two things that we can do with such sponges underwater. We can either decrease the volume of water that they contain or increase it by very simple mechanical procedures. For instance, if a submerged saturated sponge is squeezed, cooled, or rotated, the sum of the water inside of it will be released into its surroundings, decreasing its mass. But once the sponge is no longer disturbed, the pressure on the millions of tiny pores is relieved, causing it to again absorb water and expand back into its normal resting mass. We can also pump more water pressure into the sponge in its rest state. By heating it, we can cause the pores to expand with more water than it, they can usually hold. In this case, once we relieve the added pressure, the sponge will naturally release its excess water and shrink back down into its normal resting mass. Though it would seem impossible to most people, Kozirev showed by, that by shaking, spinning, heating, cooling, vibrating, or breaking physical objects, their weight can be increased or decreased by subtle but definite amounts. And this is only but one aspect of his amazing work. Kozira found that in the presence of this energy flow, the objects that are rigid and inelastic will show weight changes. He also showed that the weight of a spinning top will change if it is vibrated, heated, cooled, or electrified. The forces of torsion waves on matter are relatively small, but they do exert a steady push. The research of a number of Russian theorists have directly associated the energy of torsion fields with the energy of gravity, 
thus leading to the term gravispin energy. In these new theories, gravity and spin are coupled in the same basic manner as electrostatics and magnetism are joined to form the, elect the electromagnetic wave. Though these torsion waves can travel in any direction, they are tip most typically absorbed in the downward flow of the gravitational field. So the strongest effects of the pressure of torsion waves would be a slight spiraling movement that is joined with gravity. And since it is a very subtle pressure, we do not typically notice any such movement in ourselves or in falling objects. Many of Kozirev's mechanical detectors of torsion waves involve objects in motion, such as a rotating gyroscope or a swinging pendulum. A simple analogy can help us to understand how such objects in motion were able to capture this gentle pressure. If you have a ship at sea and do not align your sails with the direction of the wind's flow, then your ship will not move. Your sails must realign with the direction of the wind, and if the wind's current changes, then you must also move the sails to capture the new direction. Kosher demonstrated how the simple shaking of a weight on this rubber, rubber strip will cause its weight to increase and that it would slowly drop back down to its normal resting mass once it was placed back on the balanced beam. The time that the object takes to return to its normal weight is how he measured the latent force that, that it is capable of holding. Certain objects will gain and lose weight faster than others in Kozarov's experiments. And he concluded that the rate at which an object gains or loses weight is actually based on its density or thickness and not on its overall weight. He showed that the loss of weight occurs at an exponential rate and that the denser the material is, the quicker the residual forces will disappear. If this seems too hard to understand, we could think of the fact that a denser, thicker sponge, such as the foam used in a mattress or seat cushion, has much more of a spring to it than a lighter, thinner one, such as an old, uh, tired kitchen sponge. The more of a spring that the material has, the quicker it can absorb and release energy. Kozarev also tested these effects on copper, brass, quartz, and a number of other materials. He indicated that the largest effects with maximum preservation times were observed on porous materials like brick and volcanic tuff. This should interest us since the sponge in our analogy is also a porous material, meaning that it is filled with many pores or holes inside of itself. We discussed Kozarev's experiments where an object would be disturbed in various ways and its changes in weight would then slowly return to a balance over time. There is one important factor that emerged in these experiments and does not easily fit in with the convenient analogy of the sponge in water, and that is known as effect quantization. When something is quantized, that means that it does not move or count smoothly, but only stepwise in certain specific intervals. Simply put, the weight of an object would not increase or decrease steadily in the latent force experiments but rather in sudden bursts. This is certainly a highly anomalous property for matter to have. As Kozirev said, in the vibration experiments on a balance, the weight reduction occurs stepwise, beginning with a certain vibration power. As vibration frequency is further increased, the weight reduction at first remains the same and then grows stepwise by the same value. This effect quantization occurred in almost all of Kozarev's experiments, whether the overall weight of the object in question was either increasing or decreasing. It doesn't seem as though Keeley ever mentioned this quantization in his own work. It would be interesting to determine the nature of this quantization. One speculation is that it might follow a harmonic order. For instance, perhaps there is a weight change at the lower harmonic 
with no further weight changes until the subsequent higher harmonics are reached. One aspect that certainly seems consistent with Kikili's work is that the weight changes are set to increase with increasing vibra vibrational frequency. Similar to that of Keeley's gyroscopic vibration contraption described earlier in the video, in which the levitation height seemed to be positively correlated with a vibration frequency. The article goes on to say that Kozirov's experimental results show that the organizing property of time exerts a very small influence on all systems. Therefore, it is not surprising that this entity has been missing in our system of scientific knowledge. However, being small, it is ubiquitous in nature, and only the possibility of it being stored is needed. There are indeed other theories about gravity as a function of time, but they are somewhat different from Kozirov's, which would make for a great discussion in a future video. This latent force is indeed interesting, but Kozirov is not the only one to take notice of this property. If we go back to the previously described Weights and Jars experiment, Keeley claimed that on two occasions, when an observer removed the disc from the top of the jar, the suspended weights instantly fell, crashing through the bottom of the glass cylinder. So it seems that the small weights were levitated with the sound, but remained suspended even after the sound was discontinued. This certainly sounds like a latent force. Other versions say that the suspended weights would not fall until made to do so by sounding a different frequency. And what was the significance of the whizzing spindle? I've been unable to find any reference to it in any other literature. But if I had to guess, I might think that it might be a torsion generator used as a way to sensitize the experiment to the etheric flows. Perhaps Keeley used this before developing the sensitized disc to take its place. Kozirov himself devised a sensitized device in the torsion beam balance that he used in some of his weight experiments. He suspended his specialized beam with a string attached to a filament. The top of the filament where the beam balance was hanging from was mechanically vibrated by an electromagnetic device. The experiments were not considered valid unless the beam would remain perfectly still even in the presence of these extra vibrations at the top of the string. However, these extra vibrations jiggling the top of the string created a greater sensitivity to outside vibration that would reverberate throughout the entire object. The article says that when you add the stress of the vibrations moving up and down the string and into the balance itself, you have all the necessary ingredients to make the detector so extremely sensitive that even the whisper soft pressure of the torsion waves can show a measurable effect. If the extra vibrational energy is not included, then you'd be lucky to ever see a reaction because the push of the torsion waves is normally not strong enough to move a stationary object. Many scientists who have tried to replicate Kozirov's experiments have often not succeeded because they do not see the extra vibrations as being important. This is what leads me to believe that the rotating spindle may have had a similar torsion or ether sensitizing effect in Keeley's earlier experiments. It is also important to note here that Keeley claimed to not have always been able to operate his machines if ambient vibrations were off or if there were significant vibrational disturbances in the environment. Another possible account of latent force in metaphysical literature is in what is known as the Nanaur Tibetan account. In this case, an Austrian man named Lanaur states that while at a remote monastery in northern Tibet during the 1930s, he had witnessed the demonstration of two curious sound instruments which could induce weightlessness in stone blocks. The first was an extremely lar large gong three and a half meters in diameter, composed of a central circular area of very soft gold, followed by a ring of pure iron, and finally by a, a ring of extremely hard brass. When struck, 
It produced an extremely low dump sound, which ceased almost immediately. The second instrument was also composed of three different metals. It had a half oval shape like a mussel shell and measured two meters long and one meters wide with strings that were stretched longitudinally over its hollow surface. Lenauer was told that it emitted an inaudible resonance wave when the gong was struck. The two devices were used in conjunction with a pair of large screens positioned so as to form a triangular configure, uh, triangle configuration with them. When the gong was struck with a large club to produce a series of brief low frequency sounds, a monk was able to lift a heavy stone block with just one hand. Lenawe was informed that this was how their ancestors had built protective walls around Tibet and that such devices could also disintegrate physical matter. Unlike many of the other levitation accounts which required continuous sound, the technique in this case appeared to have had a latent effect. From what can be gathered, it appears as though the gong was only momentarily stimulated, after which time the stone was much lighter. If this is describing a latent effect, it most certainly will have worn off after some time, at which point the stone will have regained its full apparent weight. There's definitely a lot to unpack here. Keeley's prose in particular is very dense. Being so far ahead of his time, he had to invent many of his own terms, which in turn were derived from scientific and technical terms of his own time. Some of these terms are rather antiquated and not always directly translatable into our own present scientific vernacular. Also, single devices or processes at times appear to have had several different names. Keeley was also very secretive and did not take many into his confidence. There were times when he vehemently refused to divulge any details of his activities, even to his stakeholders. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that he may have at times purposely shrouded many descriptions of his work in, in principles in unnecessarily wordy and sometimes cryptic nomenclature. Nevertheless, we can certainly see striking similarities between Kozirev's torsional time flow and Keeley's sympathetic energy streams. The similarities include the latent force effect and also extend to the ideas of Tesla, Lee Scowning, Otis Carr, Victor Schauberger, John Searle, and others, though there are also some distinct differences amongst these theorists. One thing is certain, though, if all the accounts written on them are true, then it means that each at least had a substantial piece of the puzzle. But the research continues. One place to start is to substantiate these connections and to un uncover even more connections between these theories and to develop experiments to confirm and flesh out those connections. In Vibratory Lift Part 3, I will create my own torsion balance and attempt to duplicate Kozirev's time flow energy results. Of course, one of the major questions remains that, did the ancients really know how to use these principles and incorporate them into developing a megalithic sonic technology? In Japan, there is a megalith called the Ishi no Hoden at the Ushiko Shrine. A striking feature of this shrine is a large stone monolith estimated to weigh about 500 tons. It is called the Yukishi or floating stone as it appears to be floating in mid-air just above the water. The monolith was carved in from all four sides resulting in a pillar at the center of the base. The base is not visible at eye level thus creating this incredible illusion. This building feat took tremendous skill as the monolith is about half the weight of the famous Great Stone of the South at Baalbek, one of the largest ancient monoliths in the world. The builders seemed to go out of their way to make this stone appear as though it were floating in mid-air. Was this only the reflection of a spiritual or religious concept of holiness on soil by contact with the ground? Or were the ancients giving us a lasting visual of the process by which the great stones were moved, 
namely levitation. As unlikely as it may seem, at the very least, it is certainly an intriguing thought. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.